Good evening, everyone. Um, my presentation is going to be um, visual and spoken, and, and it's, it's partly visual because I'm only five foot two, and if I'm close to the podium, you, you don't get to see me anyway. So um, uh, I, I just want to, to share with you my, my ethical journey, uh, which started when um, I was 17 years old in publishing and wanted to spend every penny I possibly could um, on uh, things that were part of the solution and not part of the problem. Um, and uh, I, I, after publishing and advertising and starting a, a, a social marketing um, agency, I, I went to Japan. And, um, and in Japan, um, I tried to do what every ethical consumer was doing in the, the early 90s, which was to try and find uh, fair trade produce. You're, those of you who are old enough might remember the... Uh, delicious fair trade Nicaraguan coffee, um, but not terribly good if you ever found it fair trade fashion. Well, I was in Japan, and the point was that there was very little awareness of fair trade, the need for it. Um, most people who worked would work on a, a, a Saturday and bought, barely saw their children, so when you started to talk about exploitation, there was very little understanding of it. So what we had to do is we really had to talk about the incredible craftsmanship, the incredible skills. Uh, we had to produce beautifully designed product, um, things that people really wanted. It wasn't going to get a sympathy vote. And that's how we started People Tree. Um, and you know, really, it was very much linking human rights um, with, so, with environmental justice. Um, so this is a picture of me in the field. Um, we were the, the first company to get the Global Organic Textile Standard, that Soil Association on um, the organic supply chain that took organic cotton all the way um, from the field through the ginneries, the, the production of the fabric, and then onto um, the tailor's workbenches. And these were all through, um, through fair trade. And, and part of this was because we realized that we had to start doing trade differently. Trade could be used as a tool for good. And the, sadly, conventional trade was doing absolutely the opposite. It was putting profits above um, people in the planet. And, and I decided that we, would, we, we started supply chains both in, in fair trade and organic foods but also in, um, in fashion because we wanted to concentrate on how we could prove that a fair trade and sustainable fashion model could work. And this is 28 years ago and journalists would come up to me and say, well, why are you making an organic cotton dress? You don't eat it. You know, that's, that's daft, you know. And, and we would explain that this was better um, for the farmers, it, it paid them more, it supported indigenous seed banks, it meant that they could invest in the fertility of the soil and, and, and really support the other rotational crops that they were producing. Um, and, and this led me on to really beginning to understand and unpicking just how incredibly polluting um, the, the, the garment industry is. Um, so I'd like to just kind of move on through that journey. So really, the, the, the start of building People Tree was very much to go and visit um, the workers in the slums, um, also in the garment factories, to understand what fair trade fashion should be fairer than, um, and understand that link um, with the economically marginalised people, farmers and artisans in the so-called majority world, um, and, and their link to the environment, and how by protecting and producing products that really protected the environment, we could also support um, the, the environment locally. So the organic cotton really was very much to, to support farmers with that premium, um, but also to support their ecosystem. And, and paying a fair price meant that they were receiving um, premiums of about 30% more. But it was a very unconventional way of doing trade, because what we were doing is we were linking the artisans and the producers with the customers. We were bringing them to, to Tokyo, but we were also taking the buyers to actually meet the producers in Bangladesh and in India and in Kenya, and to use craft skill um, as a way of really generating uh, livelihoods in some of the most economically marginalized villages um, in the developing world. Uh, many of you will recognize Emma Watson. She came to me when she was 19 and said it would be fantastic to make a fair trade and sustainable fashion collection that really spoke to her generation. 
and we made three collections together and at the same time um, we created some really fantastic media stories and magazines and some short films to start talking about why ethical fashion, sustainable fashion, fair trade fashion was the way that the industry needed to go. Um, and, and that has brought us on to this campaign. My most recent book was called Slave to Fashion, which looks at modern day slavery, um, not only um, in the fashion industry, but also caught up in, in industries that surround um, fashion. So looking at child labor, forced labor, um, excessive overtime, and human trafficking, and how that feeds into um, the fashion industry as, as we know and we buy it in the high street. Um, so obviously, you know, when, when, you're, when you're doing this work, you know, journalists would ask me, well, you know, is it, is it important that it's supporting 5,000 people and their families, or, you know, is it, is it creating a different model, a model that proves that fashion could be done differently? And I think more and more, you know, over the, over the, the, the five or ten years at the beginning of that journey, what became clear was that it was about showing that a different way of doing business is possible. You know, working in natural materials felt a completely intuitive thing to do. But of course now, you know, we know that 83% of our water is full of, of one to five millimeter microfibers and that when you wash a garment that's made of synthetic or, or which, which is now more than 80% of the types of fiber that we use, we're washing these into, um, into our waterways. <laughs> To use fashion this as a is a short change. video of, of working with natural fibres in, fair, fair in fair trade communities. Farmers and fair trade groups, and there were two things that were central to choosing the right kinds of people to work with. One was that they put women's rights central to what they do, and the second was they really take seriously sustainability in the environment. We pioneered the standards in fair trade and organic cotton and fair trade manufactured clothing through our fair trade organisation, and that really helped us build a huge amount of dedication. I think as a creator, what's always inspired me has been the stories of people, the craftsmanship and the possibility of using trade to empower people to lift them out of poverty and to do business completely differently. You know, when you go around the developing world, you just see the most awful worker exploitation. What I wanted to do was to capture what modern day slavery, the worst of the fashion industry is. And that's what I've tried to do in Slave to Fashion. Sorry, that was a bit loud, wasn't it? I, I think with, um, with last year, 2019, really being that watershed, um, when everyone started to talk about the climate crisis in no uncertain terms, we saw Stockholm Fashion Week cancelled, um, and we, we saw um, Extinction Rebellion um, also call for the, the cancellation of London Fashion Week um, to really rethink fashion. We saw... Um, luxury fashion brands starting to really talk about how to go um, net zero within their supply chains. So we've had a huge movement towards the share economy to really begin to understand how we reduce the, 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 the greenhouse gases and, and, and CO2 emissions. At the moment, the fashion industry is responsible for, for between 7 and 8 percent of the total global carbon emissions, and that's set to increase to 25 percent by 2050, which is totally impossible. So again, you know, fashion companies and business are not only looking at the sustainable development goals, those 17 that you're probably quite familiar with, but also what I've been, been excited about, which is this emergence of a kind of 18th, which is about activism. It's about consumers and citizens and shareholders and the media and business really pushing for a different way of doing business and trade and putting... Um, climate absolutely central to the financial systems and to all the new economic systems or the, creating the new economic systems that we so need. And we're beginning to see, you know, with Donut Economics, um, Kate Rower's fantastic book, um, with um, the, the documentary, you, you've probably seen Apocalypse Cow by, um, by George Monbiot, um, Rob Hopkins' fantastic book, book, What If, that there are different ways of moving through this transition, that we can all be um, part of the change. I think 
one thing for me was just, you know, when the Kardashians finally admit that, you know, having five fridges is probably not a good idea um, and that we have a climate emergency, things really start to change. I'm going to zip through here because I, I, I think I'm over time. I was part of a group of business people that put together um, something called Business Declares a Climate and Ecological Emergency. And this is really galvanising business um, in the same way that you now have XR doctors and XR lawyers and XR teachers and nurses. And I think the excitement is that finally, after 30 years, we're having discussions about the dysfunction of capitalism. And within this space, we have this incredible dynamism and this incredible move to reinvent everything and to reinvent it now. So I'm very excited um, to, be, uh, to be part of this discussion tonight about um, Conway Hall and how we raise money for it, because I'm so excited to, to be part of it and have, have, run a couple of, um, have run some events here before. Um, I recently set up something called Real, um, which is um, looking at how we transition in our living and leadership to creating the regeneration in terms of society and business. So if you'd like to have a look at that um, on, uh, on Twitter or on, uh, on the web, on web or the, um, on, online, um, please do have a look. Um, it, it covers different topics from activism all the way through to, um, to fashion and beauty and well-being. So I, I'm going to leave it there. And um, I, oh, actually, there's a wonderful one-minute video I'd love to show you if you can. You are not mature enough to tell it like it is. Even that burden you leave to us children. You say you love your children above all else. And yet you are stealing their future in front of their very eyes. You only talk about moving forward with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess. Even when the only sensible thing to do is pull the emergency brake. Many people say that doesn't matter what we do. But I've learned that you are never too small to make a difference. And if a few children can get headlines all over the world just by not going to school, then imagine what we could all do together if we really wanted to. But to do that, we have to speak clearly, no matter how uncomfortable that may be. We cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. And if solutions within this system are so impossible to find, then maybe we should change the system itself. Our civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity for a very small number of people to continue making enormous amounts of money. The year 2078, I will celebrate my 75th birthday. If I have children, maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you. Maybe they will ask why you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. We have not come here to beg you to care. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. We have come here to let you know that change is coming, whether you like it or not.